take a seat if you can still find one. It's a great turnout. My name is Jonathan Tyrone. I'm a journalist with Bloomberg News in Vienna. I want to thank the European Geosciences Union for inviting me to moderate this talk that will try to bring us a little bit further in answering the question of whether we should frack or shouldn't frack. Uh, we have a distinguished panel, and I will introduce them now, beginning with Brian Horsfeld. Uh, he's a professor and the head of the section at Helmholtz Center in Potsdam, and he's going to try to guide us through some of the science uh, and public policy issues that the science may be able to address. Uh, sitting next to Brian is Herbert Hofstetter. He, up, oh, sorry, pardon me, the moderator's first foul. Uh, it's Julian Ve uh, Westerhoff uh, from Greenpeace here in Austria who's been looking at the issues of uh, hydraulic fracturing here in Austria. Uh, he'll, I'm sure, tell you about some of the debates that have been active uh, in this country over the last year and a half. Then we have Tom Leverage, and he is coming from London, where he's at the uh, Committee at the House of Commons looking at energy and climate change. He'll talk a little bit about the broad, overarching policy issues at stake here. And finally, from Spain, we have Jesus Carrera, who is a hydrologist and a research professor at the Department of Geosciences at the Institute <coughs> of environmental assessment and water research. So I'll keep my introduction brief since I'm the person representing largely the public ignorance around uh, hydraulic fracturing. Um, my job in Vienna is to look at the nexus of uh, nuclear science, uh, public policy, and there's also a great deal of confusion uh, that leads to uh, all sorts of fear and uh, suspicion um, between science and the broader public. And to that extent, uh, maybe uh, we can do a better job with this issue and broadening the, the, the understanding. But so today's debate uh, is going to look at the trade-offs between water and energy scarcity uh, uh, that has been identified by the US government, at least, uh, as one of the overarching megatrends that will shape the world going into 2030. Um, the U.S. National Intelligence Council released a report in December that, say, that, that, that said the growing nexus among food, water, and energy in combination with climate change will largely define uh, the next uh, 20 years of debate about security uh, worldwide. Um, so while fracking has the potential to release vast quantities of natural gas and oil to propel our carbon-based economy into the future, it also introduces risks that the general public hasn't lived with heretofore. Uh, a typical well in the U.S. or deposit in the U.S. Uh, requires an injection of about a million to five million gallons of water and five million pounds of sand and uh, proprietary chemical mixture, which I have questions about, and hopefully we'll have some uh, answers, because uh, that touches on the water debate. And again, going back to the U.S. government uh, research, we see that water, this is a quote, may become a more significant source of contention than energy or minerals out to the year 2030. So there is a high stake um, if we are expending one valuable resource in order to extract another. Um, so in my mind, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's looking at the, the sustainability of risk. We're used to uh, dealing with questions of risk in our societies, but um, uh, I think um, uh, from what I know about fracking, there's an issue about the, the sustainability of the risk. It's a 100-year-old technology, but using it over and over again uh, in a number of different wells introduces uh, uh, new calculations. 
um, and it's the absence of a clear answer to that question of risk which is uh, disturbing to the broader public. So uh, finally, uh, here in Austria, um, you know, where uh, hydropower generates around 50% of the electricity demands, there's a very uh, uh, tangible reverence to this issue of water. Uh, Viennese people are very proud to be able to walk along the water pipelines flowing from the Semmering to Vienna that delivers very clean water. So when the national energy giant announced 18 months ago that they would uh, begin exploring um, hydro uh, uh, um, fracking in uh, a region of the country that would supply natural gas for 30 years, um, uh, there was a lot of public confusion and the project was uh, uh, stopped. At the same time as this is happening, there are other Austrian companies which are leaving and building their factories in the United States and putting future jobs in Texas because natural gas to build their iron ingots and carbon permits are not as uh, 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 onerous. Um, so you have a, a tangible um, uh, microcosm of the fracking debate right here in Austria. And with that, um, um, I'd like to hand it over to the panel uh, and maybe they'll be able to give some more insight um, you know, on what the role of science in the formation of European guidelines uh, could be to make this a more rational debate. Thanks. And with that, uh, Brian, please come up. Uh, sorry, just one clarification, and I'll give it to Brian. We're going to go through a seven-minute presentation for each panelist. Uh, we'll have a debate up here um, for another 15 minutes, and then we'll throw the uh, panel open. We'll, we'll open the panel to questions. So please prepare great questions. Thanks. Right, good afternoon, everybody. You should have uh, held this in a football stadium, apparently. Um, I don't think one of us has actually prepared a talk on the formation of shale gas. So I hope that you at least understand the fundamentals. First of all, Gas, we mean natural gas, that means methane or ethane or propane or butane or CO2 or nitrogen or H2S. And when we talk about the shale part, that's usually a mudstone. And the muds contain nanometer-sized pores. And in order to get the gas out of these nanometer-sized pores, you have to fracture the rock. So that's the whole issue, more or less, in a nutshell. Um, from, from my perspective, I thought I'd say where I come from and what, to what I do or what we do. The GFZ German Research Center for Geosciences is located in Potsdam. It's part of the uh, Helmholtz Association. It's kind of uh, big business in that you have big projects, a large number of uh, employees. On the right hand side you'll see that we have a global program. We're evaluated every five years so we have to put together a program that we think, on the one hand, makes uh, advances in understanding processes, but you must, of course, have uh, a deliverable for mankind or for society. You see there's a whole list of these things on the right. Uh, at the bottom of these uh, is georesources. Included in georesources would be, of course, energy, fossil energy, uh, geothermal energy as well, CO2 storage, part of the picture, uh, water as well. Next, please. Oh, I can do it myself. Um, so that's what we are. What about the perspective? What are we going to talk about today? We have to talk about energy, I guess. So that means then a global perspective. Forget about little nations here and there. We're talking about a world population of 8 to 12 billion by 2050. We're going to need 40% more energy. Renewable energy is coming on stream, not fast enough. Fossil energy will be needed for the foreseeable future. Unconventionalness has made the difference. It's kind of taken us out of the yoke of the, the gas realms in the uh, Middle East leading up into Russia and also uh, from the North African and the Arab state uh, oil provinces. 
Having said that, there is a backcloth, of course, surrounding fossil energy of global warming, the need for clean energy, and the NIMBY principle, not in my backyard, certainly applies to uh, shale gas. So you'll see that our key challenges, the top one, economic growth, can't forget that. And the second one, environmental impact. I should point out that this, you could share the, show the same picture for water as well. So you were saying it's either water or energy. It's not. We have the problem. We've got to take care of both in our perspective of the future. Sustainable developments, what's that? Uh, these are defined as those that meet present day needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So our children's children, children, whatever. And there are four components, not two. Uh, one tends to think of environment and societal acceptance, but let's not forget security of supply. We do need energy, and we have to be able to produce that more and more efficiently. So this has to be uh, taken into consideration. For the, for the man in the street, um, or the politician in the cocktail bar, maybe, frequent, frequently asked questions are listed here. Where is this gas, anyway, and how much is there? Are there any real benefits? Why go to all this trouble, really? Especially in Europe. Uh, it's kind of complicated in Europe, as we know. Gas shells in Europe, we have a stratigraphic column, vertically, horizontally, we've got various countries. The black blobs are uh, black shales. On the right, you have a whole list of potential gas shale candidates. Uh, the Mikulov Marl has been referred to already, very deep in Austria, I might add. Uh, the Lyasic Shales of Germany, Alum Shale, Sweden, Denmark. All kinds of uh, energy is beneath our feet, but it's going to stay there, I guess. Uh, we have to perform tests to figure out whether it's worth taking this gas out, I think. And the reason that we do that is shown on this nice slide. Um, we know what the in-place resources probably are. That's what this big circle is. What is technically recoverable is another matter. Economically recoverable is yet another matter. And finally, proven reserves. There are none in Europe. But you have to quickly figure out which part of the circle we're at in Europe. So we need to move from the big circle inwards quickly. Uh, when I say we, who is that? Uh, industry would like to move in worldwide many advances in finding shale gas. We're involved to some degree. Uh, academia is involved in help them, helping them uh, improve efficiency of, a, of shale gas extraction. But of course, governments too want to know, surely, as part of the energy mix, how much gas might I have in the future to, uh, to produce. So here we have uh, European dimension. The operating environment, yes, it is different in Europe high population density, um, no mineral rights, the landowners, probably crucial, I would guess, water from surface and aquifers, service industries not developed, of course not, rig count is low, of course not, nothing's happened yet. Um, with political will, things can happen, top right in the pictures, you see a picture of German brown coal extraction, it can be done if the will is there, no matter how ugly it may or may not be. Shale gas was always portrayed as a dirty, uh, having a dirty method. Uh, I think we can argue about that later, maybe. Uh, the landscape, there are rules in place, the European Union. Uh, rules exist. It's up to different nations to interpret the rules, but the directives are there. Most of you who are here are probably interested, most interested, actually, in this list. Um, induced seismics. Uh, the leak is due to fracking. You can go through the whole list. And this is the stuff that we frequently read about, not the advantages, it's many of the disadvantages one reads about, potential disadvantages. Um, if we look, if we just go back a few years to 2010, um, classical exploration hadn't started, still hasn't started. Gas land appears. Um, the stuff that's appearing now, all these pamphlets, this is, thankfully, the beginning of fact-based uh, discussion. So gas land was bad, I think, completely uh, unrealistic. Luckily, most of these publications have now come out saying that, more or less, 
Shale gas, if it's done properly, the extraction should be made to work, but you've got to put some homework into it to make it work. Forget all this, let's move on. We do a small, we have a small initiative of our own. It's this so-called shale gas uh, information platform. What's rubbish, what's not rubbish? And I don't mean pro or con. I mean, let's keep the, the, the junk out, if, if, if possible, out of the argument. There are some people who uh, say, okay, fracturing's been around for a long time. In fact, 1947, two million jobs, frac jobs done. The message that we get is that that's all well and good, but this is the kind of damage you're doing. This is from Gasland. That is incorrect and misleading. Um, I was really surprised to see this, actually, as part of the EGU uh, poster. But at, at a geological congress, I didn't expect to see that. But there it is. These are some real pictures. Uh, at the bottom trend, this is where the fracking's going on. The top is where the, uh, where the water levels are. Eagleford Shale suggests that the fractures do not go very high, but go somewhere else. It's a different story. You need to look at each area uh, separately. Where does that leave us then in Europe? Because we've not done anything much yet. Although we'll be hearing in the UK things have started moving. Monitoring at industry sites would be surely an area where we as geoscientists could help out. We do have experts that have looked at petroleum systems with experts looking at aquifers. They could be brought into studies of fracking with industry cooperation. Of course, funding would be an issue. Don't take any money from industry. We'd have to take the money from somebody else. European Union, possibly. Don't know. Okay, so that's a kind of, in a nutshell, the kind of items that I think we should end up at some point uh, discussing. Thank you. Good afternoon. I will be presenting the hydrologist's view on this issue, on whether to frack or not. Uh, the issues that Brian already mentioned to some extent are the big impact on the soil use, air pollution, and on water, which is what I'm going to talk about most. There is some concern about micro seismicity. And of course, there are all these big issues that Brian also introduced, and Tom and Jorin will talk about later, which are these, you know, climate change, the big perspective, and um, I'm going to talk about the fears, huh? about the potential impacts. Um, well, first, it's a significant impact on the soil. You see this image, um, and it makes you wonder, huh? Europe is small, we don't have that much land. Actually, this picture is misleading, and this is in the European Parliament report, because it is not, uh, it's not shale gas, really, this is... Huh? Thank you. So th this picture is misleading because this is not real shale gas, it's tight gas, the wells are closer, but still, it is a large occupancy of the soil. Huh? So, so it does affect the landscape. And, and there are lots of tracks going on over there, uh, so there is noise, there is, uh, yeah, it's a change. Huh? The landscape will change, the soil use. Uh, water, yeah, um, well, this. Per well, some 30,000 cubic meters per well, which you think, well, it's not so much. Eh? 30,000 cubic meters is the yearly consumption of a small village, so it's not, it's not a big deal. But then you have to think that, well, there is perhaps on the average eh, one well per square kilometer every year. Well, then you say, well, it is starting to be relevant if we do it over a large area. And if you think that uh, this is 30 millimeters, oops, 30 millimeters a year, which is the way hydrologists think, for Spain that would be a 5% of the rainfall, 15% of the total runoff. This is huge. So water is, uh, well then of course, um, it depends. Eh? Well, is this over a large area or is it over a small area? Um, well, this is something you will always encounter in this, um, fracking debates. Uh, the perception is very sensitive to the presentation. Huh? So if I concentrate about ah, 30,000 cubic meters per well, it's not so much. If you say it's 15% of the runoff, uh, and both things are true. 
Water quality. Water quality is, is the most fearsome thing because uh, yeah, there is potential release of contaminants even for surface operations, which is most. Most of the actual incidents come from surface operations, um, from damage to the well casing, or for fracking. Actually, from actual fracking, fracking, I mean, the, the fractures uh, polluting the aquifers, there is only one case reported out of several thousands, or hundreds, or tens of thousands of wells. So, so it's not, I mean, the number of incidents is not that large. What is large is, uh, well, what is feared is the impact of these incidents. And again, here it depends. And this is an MIT report. These are some of the chemicals that are being used. And, well, basically, they try to convince you that this is basically, you know, yeah, swimming pool cleaner, uh, toothpaste. Uh, okay, uh, uh, I personally feel offended by this type of reports because when you dig a bit more, and this is the other side, huh? this is uh, clearly against uh, shale gas, huh? you realize that there is some truth. Huh? Some of these things are highly toxic. This is not something we must really fear, but this is not something that we can just say, oh, we are, using, we are injecting things like toothpaste. No, no, we are injecting chemicals which are extremely toxic, even when heavily diluted, eh? in parts per billion concentrations. They are toxic. Um, so so you, don't, you don't joke with these things. In addition to these, which are the fluids we inject for fracking, there are the natural fluids. Eh? And you all see this image of the of um, methane coming out of the tap water, um, which is not well proven. Eh? It's not clear that that was caused by fracking. But still, again, eh? perception depends on presentation. The truth is that uh, there are lots of sources, potential sources of methane, either in the damage in the casing, surface operations to the atmosphere, um, this wastewater that returns back, the flow back is, as I said, eh? extremely toxic water. It has to be dealt with very carefully. Um, and also, there is this report on the methane concentration on drinking water versus distance from a gas well. And well, there is some correlation. So, I mean, negating that there are problems is inadequate. Of course there are problems. Um, so that when the European Union did this analysis of risk, all water issues, eh? groundwater contamination, surface water contamination, total use of water resources, air, land take, all overall rating is high risk. So my point is, in terms of water, this is a serious business. You cannot look away. We are using a lot of water. We are risking contaminating water with um, bad chemical products. One of the debates is whether fractures can be controlled. Eh? And these are similar pictures to the ones that um, Brian presented, so I will not discuss much. Uh, but one thing is that the longest they have ever observed is less than 600 meters. And from that, as a very safe rule, you would say, well, if my formation or my shale, uh, my way, uh, well, is more than 600 meters away from the aquifer, bah, then I can be sure. So it's out of the tens of thousands of wells that have been drilled, no one has fracked uh, further than that. So, um, oops, I guess, we, yeah. So anyhow, I, I don't think that we can really control fractures, but at least we can monitor them. And uh, so, so if we are careful monitoring, we can be sure, we can feel safe, and, and if something goes wrong, at least we can take preventive measurements. Now, the last thing is whether a mistrust is justified or not. And to this, I want to show that uh, when a large oil company faced public difficulties in Germany, they started the public information and dialogue process. Uh, Martin Sauter provided me with, with this, uh, and it was also in your presentation. And, and there, so, yeah, they did a very clear thing, very transparent. You see people there like uh, Martin Sauter, who is sitting there, and uh, Reiner Helmig, whom I know they are two distinguished uh, um, hydrologists. Certainly, they are not there for their beauty. Uh, they are not beautiful <laughs> at all. Uh, so. It, it, it conveys some confidence. Eh? So if these guys, if people like this are looking into it, so yeah, that is good. But then on the other hand, in Spain, I've been recently revising, I was asked to revise a fracking application, 
And the geological description of the area was a Google translator into Spanish from an English paper written by Spaniards, but it was written in English. And so the guys copied the paper, put it into Google uh, Translate. And the social description, because they also have to make a little description of the social impact, it was just a cut and paste from the web pages from the municipalities in there. So, again, I don't know if mistrust is being justified. Again, here there is a, a very broad range of attitudes. My feeling is that large companies are more serious about it. It's a big portion of their business, and they realize they have to convince the public. But there are also a bunch of, a lot of uh, wildcats. So it depends. So, this German panel I mentioned before came up with these recommendations, which I make mine. Huh? I share them. Martin, this I took from your presentation. I modified it a little bit. First thing, uh, well, this is a huge thing, huh? the, a new dimension of risk. This is a operating of a very, very large region uh, for a long time, so you cannot overlook it. But then, on the other hand, risk there is a high risk, but risk is not something to be feared. Something, risk for an engineer or a hydrologist like me, risk is not to be feared, risk is to be managed. So there is no reason in principle to ban hydraulic fracturing in general, but you have to be very careful. Oops. And um, So they come up with a number of recommendations, stay away from tectonically active areas, stay away from aquifers from a certain distance. And one thing that everyone agrees, in every commission I have participated, we all agree, is that the legal framework in Europe needs to be adapted. Uh, this thing has been very successful in the United States, with some impact, but I think overall not too bad. Um, but it has been very successful because they have a, a legal framework which is different from here. We are not the US, we are Europe. We do things differently, sometimes worse, sometimes better, uh, but we need to adapt the legal framework to our situation. The legal framework is not adequate in Germany, in Spain, in Europe in general. Thank you very much. Hi. Can you hear me? Everyone hear me? Yeah, good. <laughs> um, okay, so... I've got quite a lot to squeeze into seven minutes, so I'll go um, relatively quickly. Um, first of all, I just thought I might as well tell you um, where I'm from and who, who I represent to give you some context. Um, next, to tell you about some of the UK's energy and climate change um, sort of, uh, objectives um, and also simultaneously challenges. Um, and even though it's UK focused, I think there's quite a lot. Um, which can be sort of read into the European situation as well. So hopefully it's, it's relevant um, to the wider EU as, uh, as well. Then I'm going to outline um, briefly the role shale gas might play in relation to these objectives or challenges, um, and then conclude um, basically by saying it's really hard to conclude. So um, in terms of the uh, House of Commons, um, uh, they have um, select committees, and they're made up of MPs, and their job is to scrutinise the role of government. Um, my Committee, the Energy and Climate Change Select Committee um, uh, uh, basically holds and the Department for Energy and Climate Change to account. The way we do that is through inquiries where we um, uh, uh, invite civil society to submit oral and written evidence and on the basis of that evidence we draw conclusions and recommendations, give them back to government and try to um, improve the uh, policy making process. My job within that is, um, as a specialist is to try and make sure the MPs um, uh, sort of informed enough to be able to do their job effectively. Um, in terms of shale gas, the committee's looked at, at the issue twice. It did an um, inquiry in 2010 and 11, just as um, the first company, uh, Cordrilla, in the UK started to um, do some explo exploratory drilling. Um, and in that first report, we concluded that there shouldn't be a moratorium uh, in the UK and that shale gas exploration should go ahead. We've just done a, um, a subsequent inquiry. The report hasn't been published yet. Um, and uh, I'll be sort of drawing on some of the evidence that we received for that um, to sort of inform my talk. Um, so in terms of the UK's uh, energy and climate change challenges, um, there's sort of three uh, major ones. The first one is energy security. In the past, the UK has um, had the benefit of cheap and abundant um, North Sea oil and gas. This is now declining, um, which means that we're going to have to start looking for alternatives. Um, and then combined with that, we have E-directives, which mean that 
a lot of our coal-fired power stations uh, are going to be closed down um, over the next few years. Another challenge is climate change. Um, the UK has the Energy and Climate Change Act, which commits us to 50, uh, 80% reduction in um, greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Again, we have the EU um, Renewables Directive, which requires us to meet... Um, to have 15% of our energy come from renewable sources by 2020, um, and of course there's sort of wider international commitments. Um, then the third big challenge is the cost to the consumer. So declining domestic supply, increasing imports as a result, and government support for low carbon um, technologies means that the price of bills is rising. So the government has a job there to try and um, avoid uh, people going into fuel poverty, um, and also to avoid uh, meeting a consumer tolerance threshold. You know, what are people willing to pay for energy and what are the consequences if they're not willing to pay for it? So you know, that's the kind of context. Now, what role can shale gas, whether domestically produced or internationally produced, play within that? In terms of energy security, you know, we received lots of evidence to suggest that there are tangible benefits to developing shale gas. You can have increased tax and in the UK, you know, that may um, only replace declining North Sea oil and gas um, sort of revenues, but still nonetheless important. A boost in employment, it's a very labour-intensive industry. Um, enhanced security, reducing our reliance on imports, um, and potentially re reducing the domestic price of gas, which I'll come on to in a bit. Um, well, where does the evidence come from? Well, America, you know, America has seen um, all, you know, improvements or positive um, outcomes from in all those areas. Um, but in terms of the UK and the EU, it's still very uncertain as to what the shale gas industry will actually look like, so, which makes it very hard to draw any kind of sort of uh, concrete conclusions uh, on the types of benefits we might get in terms of energy security. In terms of climate change, we received evidence um, from some quarters which suggested that shale gas uh, and gas more generally could act as a cheap transition fuel uh, in our move to a low carbon economy. Um, and you know, this is good because shale gas or uh, methane gas has less CO2 emissions than, for example, coal. Um, and then ultimately this gas would have to be removed at a later date, of course. Um, however, there's huge uncertainty, again, in terms of you know, how much emissions shale gas actually produces in terms of its life cycle emissions. Uh, I'm sure you're all aware it's hotly contested. Um, there's sort of several different reports in America at the moment which are showing um, that either shale gas... Uh, it, it is more harmful than coal, or that it actually it's, you know, it's, it's as good almost as um, uh, conventional gas. And there's a potential to negatively impact low carbon uh, investment, uh, and indeed um, the question of global emission reductions as a result of shale gas is also questionable. We know in America um, coal has largely been displaced by gas for electricity generation, um, but actually much of this coal is now being imported to e the EU, where, you know, we're actually entering a, a, an age of coal uh, as a result. Um, so the role that shale gas can play in a carbon-constrained world, and in the UK um, we, we do live in a carbon-constrained world because of our Climate Change Act, the role that um, shale gas and gas more generally will play um, will be determined by whether carbon capture and storage is able to be demonstrated at commercial scale, um, how we choose to control our emissions, so do we use a market-based mechanism or a standards-based mechanism, um, and the level of government support for low-carbon technologies. Um, very briefly on social and uh, environmental impacts, um, I think we've already seen some of them, so I won't go over them again. In our first report, we basically concluded that a lot of these could be avoided as long as they're carefully managed, have a strong regulatory um, uh, system in place, and that the, importantly, that the regulator um, is equipped and has the teeth to actually enforce the regulation. In terms of prices... Um, obviously, the shale gas revolution has seen prices um, plummet uh, over a very um, short period of time, and this has led to speculation um, to the extent this will happen in the EU and the UK. Um, prices could fall as a result of shale gas because it could put increasing pressure on the logic of oil gas price indexation. Um, we could get cheaper gas from America, and also we could have domestic production. However, cheap prices aren't um, guaranteed you know, we also had evidence to suggest that um, a, a decline in oil gas price indexation won't necessarily lower prices. Um, you know, if we're more reliant on uh, spot markets and LNG, um, the price could be more 
uh, variable and, and, and also higher. Imports will be determined by the cost of transportation, which is very expensive, and domestic production, especially in the UK, is likely to be subject to quite strict regulation, and if you're a business, that means it will cost more, and that means that the gas will cost more. Um, in addition to those three factors, so I've got two more that I briefly want to touch on, um, and this is, you know, uh, two more factors which increase the un uh, level of uncertainty um, about the role that shale gas will play. Um, these are below ground factors, which we've already heard about, basically how much is there and how much will it cost to extract, and then public acceptance. The International Energy Agency um, has said that this will be a crucial factor in terms of you know, how shale gas will be taken up around the world. Um, and broadly speaking, uh, my committee agrees. Uh, but in the UK, it's still a very unknown um, factor. So to conclude, um, I think it's clear that shale gas probably could play um, a role in helping to meet um, the three um, objectives and challenges that I outlined in the beginning, energy security, climate change, and, and cost of energy. Um, but the underlying uncertainty, um, again, which I've just outlined, is means that it's probably too early to tell uh, exactly what role shale gas will play. That's it. Thank you. You hear me? Um, I'm coughing a little bit every now and then. I'm sorry for that. That doesn't really uh, go away. Um, just to note to whom I'm talking, can we start with a very short opinion poll? Uh, who thinks we need shale gas? Please raise your hands. Ah, um, well, gas industry won't like you, I think. Um, well, I share the opinion of most of the people in this room. Um, do we need shale gas? No, we don't need shale gas. Uh, I think I... No, going on one hour or so. Um, uh, I think for most people in this room, it's clear that the, maybe the biggest problem that mankind is facing now is the problem of climate change. And of course, we know that the solution is get rid of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. Um, what we are seeing now is that this, yeah, let's say, this battle of leaving fossil fuels is being postponed by this shale gas issue. Uh, we should be working on getting rid of the use of fossil fuels and instead of that uh, transforming our economies to renewable energy. Several countries are doing that. And now we see a debate coming where at least the oil and gas industry come to the conclusion we need shale gas. Um, I think this is a big mistake and I think it's a big danger. There is enough renewable energy. I think this is not a secret. Um, we just have to harvest it. And the most stupid thing we can do now is uh, postpone this transi transition for another, let's say, 10, 20 years by using shale gas. But this is exactly that some parts of the industry want us to do now, to use shale gas because we need it. Well, apparently they didn't impress you so far. Uh, they also don't impress us, but they impress, unfortunately, many politicians. Um, what we are seeing at this moment I would call it propaganda. Um, there are large parts of, let's say, old-fashioned industry in Europe who are saying, look at America, they have cheap gas, they have uh, economical growth, and if we don't use the shale gas we have in Europe, industry will disappear, they will go to wherever energy is cheaper, uh, Europe will be de-industrialized, de um, and we will all be poor and die unhappy or something like that. This is, this is the story that we are being told at this moment. Well, sorry to say it, but this is bullshit. Uh, if you look at those countries in Europe who are at this moment investing strongly in renewable energies, Austria, for example, Germany, those countries are doing economically quite well. Industry is doing quite well. Uh, many companies are profiting from this consistent policy of investing in renewable energy. Well, yes, there has been economical growth in the United States for, let's say, three, four years until the mid of last year. But this economical growth in the United States has not much to do with cheap energy. This was mainly private consumption, and the economical growth in the U.S. disappeared. They are in recession again, no matter how, many, how much 
shale gas they have. Um, there is another thing uh, that you have to be aware of. We have seen an internet bubble, something like 99, 2000. We have seen uh, houses, a mortgage bubble, uh, something like 2007, 2008. And now we are probably in a new bubble, a shale gas bubble. And it's always the same. If something goes up really quickly, it also goes down just as quickly a few years later. Uh, shale gas, the shale gas production has, in the United States has been going up quite steeply, more or less until last year. What we see, it's not really going up anymore. It's flattening at quite a high level. And the next thing it will probably do is just fall down as quickly as it went up a few years ago. Uh, and those companies in Europe who are now saying we need cheap energy, and if Europe does not invest in shale gas, then we will have a problem. Uh, companies like the Austrian uh, steel company, Wurst, for example, they built or they are planning to build a steel factory in the United States because they say shale gas is there and it's cheap. I think this is a big mistake. Uh, if you invest prior to a bubble imploding, uh, it may look good for a few months or a few years, but all these bubbles, they all do the same, they implode at some moment. And that's where you sit uh, with a big stranded investment of a 1 billion euro steel factory and suddenly expensive energy. Um, there is another thing about expensive, about, sorry, about cheap energy. Uh, well, I think everybody knows this, knows this, if things are cheap, you are wasting it. If it doesn't cost anything, then why use it wisely? Uh, this is what is happening with energy also. Uh, if energy is cheap, why should I invest in saving energy? This is what's happening in the United States now. Gas is cheap. Yes, at this moment it is cheap. So there is no incentive for the industry to invest in more energy efficiency. Well, you can go on like this for one or two or three years, but you cannot go on for this with this forever. What we should do is invest in energy saving, and this will not work if energy is cheap. So I'm advocating that energy should have a fair price to make us to force us to use it in a wise way and not to waste it like the Americans are doing with the shale gas at this moment. Um, there's another thing about this bubble. Uh, for many shale gas wells, the production is going up quite steeply, just as this economic thing. Um, but you see that after a few years, these gas fields are empty. They are empty much quicker than normal gas fields. This is a big problem of shale gas. It just, there is not so much there. Uh, there may be on paper there is a lot, but uh, well, we've seen this figure, these blue curves. There's maybe a huge reserve, but what really can be used is not so much. And if you use it very quickly, it also will be gone very quickly. And we are seeing that these biggest gas reserves, shale gas reserves in the United States, they are all of them are approaching the top or they are over the top. And if it's gone, it's gone. And there's no much cheap energy. Um, there is one organization playing quite a bad role here. It's the International Energy Agency. Um, the funny thing is that nobody ever reads their World Energy Outlook from last year. Journalists, journalists read what they are publishing now, but nobody ever reads what they were publishing last year or 10 years ago. And if you, so, if you look at the prognosis of the um, International Energy Agency, you see that they have a very strong tradition of making wrong prognosis. But nobody, least, nobody is reading the reports from last year. Only the reports from this year are being read. Well, last November they said, well, there is a lot of shale gas, there is a lot of shale oil, we don't have to worry about fossil fuels disappearing, that is enough. Uh, if you look at what they wrote 10 years ago, uh, they didn't want to admit yet that there is a peak oil uh, debate happening and that oil will be disappearing now. They found something new, the shale oil and shale gas. I think in a few years, uh, if you look at the report from last year, you will see that they were just missing the point completely. Uh, shale gas will not be there for such a long time. It will probably will be gone before the year 2020. Uh, the only question is how much propaganda do we have to believe until we see shale gas is disappearing. Um, yeah, my time is almost gone. Um, okay, one last point. Um, the good thing of renewable energy is that it will be there forever. Shale gas may be there for a few years, but it will disappear quite quickly. Renewable energy is there forever. Um, we need it.
to fight climate change, and we need it because we need energy. Uh, I think we should not believe the propaganda of the oil and gas industry that we can use shale gas for the rest of our lives because this just simply is not true. Renewable energy is there forever, and it's the only thing that will be there forever. Okay, here I stop. Thank you, Yurian. That was uh, excellent. Thank you all panel members for the presentations. And uh, it was great that we had an interactive element of polling introduced. Because I would like to ask another question. How many people still don't know whether there should be fracking or not in Europe? Please raise your hand. So I think the panel still has some work to do. Um, I have a couple questions, and maybe we'll have a little bit of discussion, and then we'll throw the uh, debate open to the floor. Um, you know, we have this is issue of risk management, and there have been very concrete calls from industry for the EU to develop or improve a framework on risk management. Um, and so, Risk management can be broken down into silos. So there's risk management around well construction. There's risk management around pouring the cement. There's risk management about what to do with the wastewater. I throw the question open to the panel. Um, how, how, how can you foresee guidelines, guidance from the EU developing around these different areas of risk? that are uh, uh, explicit to the activity of fracking. Brian, do you want to try? Jesus? Is it? Okay. Um, I don't know, really. I guess the, uh, I'm sorry, is this on? Yeah? Oh, it's on now. Yeah, the, uh, I think the big danger of talking about doing things at a European level is one thing. That one can come up with all kinds of uh, guidelines or initiatives, whatever. That's fine. This has taken place already in the case of the environmental um, framework for Europe. It's up to the individual nations to implement those guidelines and for each country to have its own mining laws in order to really be able to get a handle upon exploiting hydrocarbons. The UK, we've just heard about that. I think each country using a, maybe an, uh, um, what, what, would you, what do you call it, an, um, a framework, let's say, of a European perspective of rules, guidelines, they still have to be implemented, I think, at the national level. That's particularly important because the geological environment of any given uh, shale play in, for example, the UK, we're talking about uh, the Namurian shales, talking about siliceous shales, you're talking about shales that are a thousand meters thick. That's a very different situation to, you go to Germany, you go to the Posidonia shale, Jurassic Age, 50 meters thick. Or you, if you want to have an extreme case, you go to Austria and you go down way deep uh, to look at potential shale gas uh, deposits there. That's not really answered your question specifically, I know. But uh, I think we really are coming back to the point, you're bringing us back to the point, that we have to begin st talking about specifics. I think it's quite normal to hear uh, some of the ideals uh, about the future from Greenpeace and so on. That's great. But I think we have to take care of our children and our children's children. And an energy mix is an important uh, thing that we have to take care of. I know you're going to answer something. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But my point then would shot? be uh, to uh, let me. Okay, Sorry. let's hand over. Um, well, about our children and their children, um, I think we should be fair and give them a chance to decide themselves what energy they need. Uh, we know that the supplies of shale gas are not very big. 
Uh, and of course we can use it, and in 10, 20 years it will be gone. Um, I'm not sure if our children and grandchildren will be happy with us taking their energy. Maybe they might need it. If somebody says, we need it now, I say, no, this is not true. We do not need it now. Mankind came very far without shale gas. Maybe our grandchildren need gas in some form, and we used all the normal gas. I would leave the decision to use the shale gas up to them, and we should not decide for them and take their gas. It's not our gas. It's the gas of the whole world. Let me uh, jump in. Thank you very much for that. I, 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 I want to let Jesus uh, respond to this, but I'm going to introduce an element as well because um, you know the other side of the risk equation is the return. And uh, in um, this issue of fracking, one of the one of the big issues is the decline um, of uh, wells. Um, uh, which can be steep in the initial years. So uh, please, Jesus, uh, address the issue of uh, risk, but maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, this issue of decline. I, I tackle the three issues. The first one you mentioned. I think the European Commission has been great in developing uh, environmental directives. The way we live in Europe has changed thanks to things like the Water Framework Directive, and it's been great. So, of course, I trust very much the European Commission capabilities on writing directives to, to manage the risk of shale gas or whatever else. Other thing is that it is not very efficient. Right? It will take some uh, maybe 10 years to, to develop. But the truth is that once they do, uh, they are very good. My, my, my assessment, my personal opinion is that they are very good. So, yes, I trust. I trust them to, to do it. Now, this other issue of whether the shale gas belongs to us or not, um, you know, I, I, when, when things get to this point, I like to quote Mark Twain. Uh, Mark Twain used to say, well, when a scientist talks about the topic which is not his, he says the same stupid things as everyone else. <laughs> so, so if you allow me to say my own stupid thing. <laughs> now, my own stupid thing in this regard, I was not uh, judging your thing. Say I was justifying my own stupid thing. My own stupid thing is, is two things. First. Yes, uh, gas, shale gas wells, the productivity declines very fast because it's controlled by diffusion. And for those of you who know diffusion, it goes with, uh, down with the square root of time. So it's, it's yeah, very big uh, drop. But that, is, that doesn't affect so much the cost because they, they operate by saying, well, we drill new wells. And that's why it is so intensive. Eh? What I mentioned before, yeah, you have to drill a well new per square kilometer every year. And so they... They overcome that by drilling many wells. And finally, the, the final question, whether shale gas belongs to us or not. I agree with you. Shale gas does not belong to us. Shale gas belongs to the earth. But I claim that no single fracking natural resource, geo resource that is being used on earth is being paid for. We are used at taking natural resources as they come. We don't pay for the water we take, we don't pay for the oil we take, we don't pay for the natural gas, and not for the fracking gas. Uh, what we pay for is the cost of extraction, the cost of distribution, the, co the, the benefits of the companies involved, etc. So I would agree with you. We should pay to some, I don't know, United Nations fund or something. I don't know how to handle these things. We should pay, but we should apply this cost to every single natural resources we, we make use of. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Unless, do, 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 do you want to step in there, uh, Brian? Do you want to? Yeah, I was just going to make, I never thought I'd say this, but I agree completely with um, Greenpeace on one issue, and that is leaving the choice to our children's children. I agree entirely. It's for them to decide. But in order to provide them with the means to decide, I think we at least at this time should be willing to conduct tests in order to assess the shale gas potential of a formation. Whether that then turns out to be something we would want to do as a nation, and it does come down to nations, that's a different thing altogether. But to continue the rhetorical exchanges, I think that's doing our children's children no favors. And so to now make some pro actions, some positive actions to say what is there, do we want to take it out? If so, under which circumstances? I think we owe that to our children's children. And one brief, and it is a brief point, you're talking about shale gas. Uh, maybe there are organic geochemists uh, in the crowd here. I think most who have read the textbooks know that 
in a disseminated form, there's 10,000 times as much TOC, total organic carbon, as you find in any coal, in any gas, in any oil. It's coming down. It simply does, at the end of the day, come down to whether you can produce stuff economically. It will not run out for a long time. Whether you choose to not extract it, that's another matter. But there's lots and lots of it. Tom, you mentioned in your presentation that this is a very labor-intensive activity, and we're speaking to a room full of young geologists in a continent right now where there's very high unemployment among young people. So is this fact that it's a very energy-intensive industry uh, uh, in its way um, uh, beneficial to the risk assessment because it's going to be producing something and giving lots of people something to do, including regulation, I suppose. Uh, but can you tell us a little bit about um, the characteristics that make it so uh, uh, labor-intensive? I mean, what, 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 what are all these people doing? Uh, yeah, okay. So as part of our recent inquiry, the committee spoke to um, Mike Yeager, who's um, CEO for Petroleum at um, BHP Billiton, and they've got quite... Um, sort of extensive shale gas operations in the US at the moment, and he was describing the level of labor intensity compared to a conventional onshore and offshore um, oil and gas extraction. Um, you know, so basically, it's a, it's a young industry. Uh, there's a lot of pads. They have to be moved around a lot. Um, it requires more people. I can't say much more than that. But in, in terms of how it plays into the, the wider risk assessment, in terms of pros and cons of developing shale gas, uh, you know, it's, it's a factor which plays in. It, it could create jobs and it could create more revenue, but again, it's a choice for uh, you know governments to decide you know where the balance lies and, and what is an acceptable risk based on the pros and cons. Just briefly, wanted I know we've moved on a bit now, but uh, uh, on the regulation point, um, ever since Piper Alpha uh, disaster in the North Sea in the 80s, um, the UK specifically has a, had a really strong regulatory regime, particularly for offshore oil and gas extraction. Um, when we had industry come in and give evidence to us, um, they said that they really liked uh, the regulation, partly because it was principles-based rather than prescriptive. So instead of saying you need to wear uh, orange overalls, you say you know, all employees need to be protected. And actually, it seems, uh, based on the evidence that we got, that that's what industry would favour in terms of regulation. And very briefly, on the point of... Um, whose emissions are they and how, how we should manage them. I mean, the, the EU has an emissions trading framework, um, emissions trading system, and you know, that is a mechanism that we can use to say, okay, we have this, we can emit this much carbon based on the scientific evidence that we have. You know, we have to work within that framework. So, you know, I, th I think it's too simplistic to say yes or no to shale, but rather what role can shale play given the limits that we have and, you know, when we have to meet them. So, you know, will, will, will uh, carbon play a role in the energy system forever? Probably not, you know, considering that we want to live in a carbon-constrained world. But until that time, it's a question of you know, what role does it play, given the limitations that we have. Okay, I just have one final question I'd like to direct to Yuri. And, um, we, we, we heard about this issue from Jesus, uh, uh, that you know, perception depends on presentation. Uh, and... You know, what's your experience uh, if this debate is inevitable um, uh, and, 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 and the public is going to be involved, uh, you know, what should industry be doing uh, on their part to present uh, the data, to present the information in the best possible way so that there's a real debate happening? Um, well, I think that the time where uh, industry could, could impress people with data is gone. Uh, in Austria, I think the situation is the same as in most European countries. People don't want shale gas. Um, the debate in Austria was uh, short and intensively. Uh, something like one and a half year ago, the Austrian energy com uh, oil company, OMV, announced that they will invest in shale gas in the northeast of Austria. Uh, and in the beginning, nobody was really so much aware about uh, what does this mean. And within months, there was a very strong local resistance because people started searching in the internet, what is shale gas, do we need it, what risks do we see? And 
almost everybody was against it. The only people who were not against were the retired employees of the OMV, more or less, to simplify it a little bit. And all young people are against shale gas. Uh, if you look now uh, at the whole debate uh, that happened in this one and a half year, uh, OMV withdrew because resistance was just too much. And at the same time, we are seeing that people want clean energy. Everybody now wants photovoltaic on the roof because they see that if we need energy, we should do something. We should invest in solar panels. There is a strong support now for wind projects. And well, you know, wind projects is a big change in the landscape. And it's not uh, extremely popular for many people. Uh, but if you look at what happens in small local referenda about wind projects, they are all supported. Nobody wants shale gas. People want clean energy. So I think it doesn't matter so much anymore what the European industry says about the benefits of shale gas. People are very much aware that we do not need shale gas, and instead we should invest in renewable, renewable energy. Thanks. So before I open it up to the real experts on the floor, I think Brian wanted to have one. You have a couple more slides that you wanted to, to show? It's okay? Okay, okay. So uh, with that, um, I see a hand right here. Uh, this is the first one I see. I know, I, there's another one back there. Um, <coughs> to the left here. Please, um, please, 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 please uh, try to direct your question uh, to the panel uh, members. So uh, Sam Illingworth, University of Manchester. Um, it is kind of really to the whole panel, though. It's obviously great to be having this debate today, but I think it kind of, there's been all this talk about children's children, undermines the greater question that by having this time now to discuss fracking, whether we should, whether we shouldn't, I think everyone's in agreement that it's not a long-term solution to our energy problems. And by all the time and effort that's going into this now, we're actually just you know, shifting focus from the real question that needs to be answered, which is how and why, how do we solve the um, issue of energy for the future? So that's just my, basically my point, really a comment to the, to the board. Anybody want to take that up on the panel? Um, well, uh, there are two things that need to be done. First, save energy as much as possible. There are two places where you can do that really well, traffic and house heating, and the rest is invest in renew renewable energy. And there is a huge potential for renewable energy. There's really enough, there's more than we need. We only have to invest. And the more we invest now in shale gas, the less focus we put on what we really need to do. I, I agree. No, I, I agree with what you say. However, let us not fool ourselves. Brian said it before, let me support what Brian said before. Shale gas, we have a lot of shale gas. So in terms of amount, there is plenty. And there will be for our children and for the children of our children if we get into it. So to me, uh, humankind lives on 10 years. Huh? We don't look beyond. Shale gas is for much more. My concern is I don't want the situation we have in the States. I don't want cheap energy. And, uh, and, and I mean, sustainability is not just an issue of energy, it's of many things. So, so we must keep on fighting on that. But forget it, eh? Shale gas, we have, if we get into it, it will be for many years to come. Um, I tried to touch on it really briefly in my talk. Um, there, there could be potential impacts. You know, the, the narrative of shale gas and the implications of going for a dash for gas, especially in the UK, could have implications on you know, how we decarbonize the economy and meet our climate change objectives. Um, but the reality is, especially in the UK, is closing coal-fired power stations um, and potentially closing nuclear power stations means that we are matter-of-factly going to be relying on gas much more, at least in the, in the medium term. So the question is, you know, how, where do we get the gas from and, and how do we use it? Um, and what contingencies do we put in place to ensure that... Um, as we're using that gas, um, we're not also undermining uh, efforts to develop low-carbon technologies and transition to a low-carbon economy. Um, there was, there was, I, I, the one back there, and then... Okay. Oh, Hello? Okay. Oh, I... <laughs> Shall I ask? Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, I always wish to ask the panel, uh, is there a rough estim estimate how much shale gas reserve do we actually have? Uh, some, well, some, uh, one of the panelists claim we only have like a decade or so, but is, that, is it really a decade or 50 years, 100 years? Is there just a rough guess how much there really is? Should I say, so? Should I say something on that? Mr. Chairman? Please. <laughs> right. Yes. That's a really uh, good question because what it's emphasizing is the point that we know there's a lot in the ground. How long it will last is a different business altogether. Remember I showed the blue uh, onion type structure. Where your shale deposit is within that onion shaped world, you have to do tests of course. And so whether it lasts 10 or 100 years, that depends how the shale fracks. And that depends very much on the heterogeneity of the formation, and of course, the percentages of clays versus uh, silica versus carbonate, things like this, versus organic matter richness. So there is no answer. I think if you, unless you go out there and actually start drilling some test holes, we can meet here in 10 years from today and the argument will be the same, I think. We have to make some strides forward. The ideals are clear, what the future world will hopefully look like. But I'd like to throw out another point, and that is, we're talking about 50 years from now or 30 years, and this huge increase in world population. We've not even mentioned the, cha the political changes that are gonna take place. Europe can sit here and continue debating, no problem, without knowing how much shale gas it has beneath the ground. That's okay, you can just ignore the shale gas. Maybe the day will come when it will be good to know for our children or whoever how much we really have, because maybe an energy mix in the future will still be important. Remember the balance, uh, the political balance within the world is changing, and so we don't know what the future really holds. I'd play my cards very safely. I'd like to know what I was standing on. Thanks, can we have this question here in the middle? Okay, it is an issue if we know what, uh, if we know about the shales, we know a lot about the shales. Now, in Estonia, they used to burn shale like coal, like a poor coal. Uh, now, I think the gentleman from Spain has a possibility to add us much more information, and that because in Portoiano, at the Empresa Nacional de Pizarra Bituminosa, uh, back in 1959, I spent four months studying the issue of producing uh, carburantes and uh, uh, whatever, <laughs> uh, from those shales. Now, the issue is, back in those days, the shale was mined, brought above the ground, retorted under high temperature, and liquids and carburantes were created. Now, what remained was an ash that we really didn't know what to do with. Today, Tallinn is poisoned because of that ash. I assume that in Portoiano, you have still mounds of the same stuff. Now, 90s, fast forward, 1970s, uh, the oil shale in the United States. I was taken in by TASCO, the Oil Shale Corporation, as a consultant with experience because I spent four months back in 1959 in Portoiano. Now, the problem was Again, retorting, the same thing. Occidental oil said, no, we are going to do it in situ. Why it, this didn't succeed? It was because instead of getting oil, they got gas. Because the high temperature they were <laughs> producing underground was in effect destroying the product they were trying to get. Okay, Jesus, would you like to no, respond to this? No, no, or no, is there a question? No, 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 no yes, that's a very good question because this helps you get to the bottom of the problem. The bottom of the problem is that we do not know what technology this fracking means. The fracking is not breaking up. You cannot break up the polymer called kerogen into small molecules by using water pressure. What you do there is high temperature. Now, there is no patent, there is no information whatsoever. 
the, the fact that some gas comes out with water is irrelevant. I'm the sorry, I really have to insist. We have problem, other people who want the questions. The problem is what products remain underground. My question is to the gentleman from Spain, from the Spanish experience, can you tell us the amount of damage that was done in Porto Llano by the mounds of ash that are above ground. Okay, because what is the residue yes, that's very, left? Very quickly, are you hearing me? Yeah, very quickly, it's a totally different technology. Eh? What is a bituminous shale is, uh, is the same thing that they have in Canada. It has nothing to do with shale gas in the way of exploiting it. You're right, in Puerto Llano they were actually excavating it and processing it in a, in a chemical engineering factory to produce gasoline. In Canada, they do it in situ, both in Puerto Llano and in Canada. It has a huge environmental impact, but it has nothing to do with the shale gas technology. Yes, now, the it is a different material. Yes, so, but the so, Oh, they're, they're Thank no, you very it's, much it's a, for that intervention. It's a very different thing. I, 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 think, I think you'll have to take that up with Professor Carrera after the panel is done. Uh, we have another question right here in the third row. Hello, uh, it's Paul Glover from the University of Leeds. Um, I'm probably fairly unique here among, among the audience because I'm also a director of a company that has done fracking in the past uh, in Canada. Uh, it doesn't do it at the moment for shale gas. Um, and what I said to the company that I represent when I've got my hat on for that company about a year and a half ago was, well, stop doing it now. The, shales, the, the gas isn't going to go away. You know it's going to stay there. And in the meantime, the technology will get better and it will get cheaper and it will get safer. And if the Americans want to carry on in their unregulated way and cause themselves problems, that's fine. But later on, we'll be able to use the gas more safely and safer in that session. Okay. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was people will try and affect your opinions. We have seen how propaganda can affect your opinions already today. We've had somebody who tried to lump all the people who don't know about shale gas as shale gas deniers. On one hand, on the other hand, and I talk from a British point of view, yes. in Britain, and a, I'll try and a question, up please. For you. I'll try and wind up for you. In Britain, and this is, has a question for it, okay? Um, we have day after day news from the British government about the problem with energy supply with gas power stations closing down, with conversions from coal to gas, from particular problems with uh, nuclear power stations that may not ever get built, uh, with 300 euros per year going on our energy bills per year. I believe that is softening us up for a government announcement pro-fracking. Now, I would like a little bit more clarity instead of this manipulation of the general public, and I'd like to know whether my feeling is true. <laughs> and it's for you. Is that for Mr. Tom Leverage from the UK? Yeah, Tom, can you enter that in um, impassioned well, um, intervention? I, just in case you... I don't know if you, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not from debt, so I don't represent government's will or view or anything like that um, from the House of Commons, and, you know, we scrutinise the work of government and try to hold them to account. Whether or not your feeling of, is true, whether or not the government is buttering us up for a dash for shale gas, um, I don't know, and I'm not really at liberty to say, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> do I leave it at that? <laughs> I think Brian everything, wants to say something here. But apart from that, everything's transparent, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> no, I've actually got a question. You were talking about... I've got a question here for the aquifer people, the water people. I, f I fully understand the concerns about the danger from below. You know, the, 
these horrific fracks that are going on and the water that could be pumped up and maybe poisoning waters. Some of these chemical additives, not only that we've pumped down, I say we, not really me, and the stuff we've dissolved out of the shales going into the aquifers. That's the real horror story. Um, if we have shales that are at 2,000 meters or 3,000 meters depth, and you're willing to give credence to the fact that the cracks can go up and contaminate the aquifers. I'm wondering how then, you must have a, a real worry then about if your aquifers are at 200 meters depth, what about all the potential sources for top down, in other words, your traditional field? Poisons going from our activities at the surface down into the aquifers. What's the probability of that being a, a real problem versus the, the fracking, which of course we draw attention to? This is a different, your classical world versus this new world. You, you don't need to worry, you don't, honestly. <laughs> don't worry. We have great professionals, hydrologists. Uh, hydro Martin, we are great hydrologists, we know. You can find the best of waters at 1,000 meters depth. Huh? One application for fracking in Spain is this far from a great freshwater aquifer that you would be very happy to drink. So. That's item one. Item two, the real worry does not come from below. Actual fractures going into aquifers, as I say, I mentioned one case out of I don't know how many tens of thousands of wells. The real accidents come from the surface or from the well. And that is happening. And we know it has happened too often. One way is one way too many. So we cannot negate that it is a risky thing. What I am saying is I don't want to live fearful. I don't have fear of anything. I don't have fear of deep waters. I don't have fear of uh, fracks coming into the aquifers. And I don't have fears of pollution. What I want is to manage those fears. I want to manage risk. Um, and one thing we will not do is to manage the risk by ignoring them. We need to face them. Could I just say one thing? That is uh, what you're saying, I think, is that it is very much an engineering issue. It's not what it's frequently presented as, the geological unknown, the deep, you know, the monster from the deep, which is really the way the, people's, the public sees it. It's really to make sure that the engineers do what they're paid to do. Okay. Right? We have uh, questions here. That's, uh, and then we'll go to the back of the hall. And then I saw somebody over here. So please. Yeah. Um, you have well explained the energy needs of our society, that the technology is not mature for fracking, that there are environmental damage that we cannot evaluate yet. So shouldn't we pursue more atomic energy, looking more the challenges to geoscientists of having a safer atomic energy? How would you rate at this moment our strategy to convert towards renewable, renewable energy, but in the meantime, ensuring a safer atomic energy, and in particular also a safer storage of radioactive waste. Uh, <laughs> I guess that's... Uh, Tom or Urien, do you want to crack no. at that one? <laughs> Maybe, I guess, I guess from the accent, that was a French guy, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Not just that, also the nuclear uh, positivism, let's say. I know that shale gas is not very popular in France. Every country chooses the direction it wants to go in. Okay. Let me put a spin on that, uh, the moderator's prerogative. Uh, do regulations uh, dictate that the age of water has to be determined through radioisotopic uh, measurements? Um, I mean, are, 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 are uh, 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 aquifers in the vicinity of um, fracking sites being tested for replenishment rates? No, I mean, theoretically, when you, when you build a fracking site, you should measure the baseline, the status of the groundwater contamination, just in case there are variations, then you can say, oh, that was because of the fracking. Um, and we, no, we, don't, we very rarely measure the groundwater age, although we should. It's a good thing that you, that you say so. Regarding the French suggestion, I would say, uh, the, the French guy, sorry, the, no, I, I, I think it's if, we get, if we wait until we are sure, you, I mean, a scientist will never be sure of anything. 
So, so my, I would suggest that we start with the safer places and we learn along the way. We, I, I don't think we should wait until we know for sure, because the only thing we know for sure is that we will all die. Back of the room, thanks. Uh, the question is why in the first presentation it was mentioned just the micro-seismicity associated to the fracking operation, and it was not mentioned the activated or induced seismicity, which you can find evidence in journals of the American Society of Seismology or Geology. Now there is evidence of earthquake of magnitude up to 5.7 and as far as 30 kilometers away from the re injection well, because at the moment there is no other technology than dispose the wastewater at 5 or 7 kilometers where we have very little control of what's going on there about stress fault and so on. Seismic activity, uh, anybody? Well, it's, it's very local. Uh, so it's induced seismicity uh, from fracking, you, you will have some micro seismicity, but not big earthquakes, I, I, I don't think. Uh, unless you do it in a tectonically active area, which um, again, we have the problem, regulations do not forbid anything, but regulation should forbid this type of... I was thinking about reinjection of wastewater, not the fracking operation. Ah. The reinjection of wastewater at the moment is the only way they have in the United States for dispose the waters which is contaminated. Mm -hmm. And it is injected in very deep wells. No, and no, now there is evidence in Oklahoma, Arkansas, and uh, I think uh, in right. Nebraska also magnitude 5 and more earthquakes generated by the reinjection wells. True. This is true. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a very clumsy operation. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. No, seriously. I mean, they inject wastewater at high pressures in the fault. You must be crazy to do that. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, no, no. Let, let us, this is no joke. You can, of course, by injecting high pressure water into a nearly active fault, you do, you do generate an earthquake. No question about it. So, I mean, the, the thing is, we know we can control that. We have institutions like GFZ. Even we have some in Spain also. Uh, yeah, we can control those things. We, maybe just one point on that. As far as I know, is that not a situation where the people are actually bringing all these frack waters to dis dispose at single sites? It's really an amazing strategy. You're bringing all this water and you're pumping it down and what a surprise, you, you get the earthquakes. It doesn't mean then that, well, maybe I should ask you then, what's the message then for, in a European context, with nothing really to worry about right now, because we're not pumping anything anywhere, um, I guess the, the lesson would be that uh, disposal has to be an important part of the risk management uh, scenario. That, that's the message I would get. Um, one thing about earthquakes. Um, originally, I come from the northeast of the Netherlands, um, where there is a lot of gas extraction since 40, over 40 years. And there always have been, when I was living there, small earthquakes. And for a long time, people were accepting this. And now, this changed. Uh, and now we are facing uh, a situation where there will be a lot of claims about damage to houses. But you have to be aware also small earthquakes can damage houses. Uh, they won't break down the whole house, but they can damage houses. And if this happens to uh, thousands of houses, uh, this is a lot of money you're talking about. And there will be a lot of claims already because of normal gas extraction. And I think we should not underestimate the risk of this if we start fracking. I think from my geological knowledge, the risks are bigger. Okay. And if you look at the geology, geology of Central Europe, uh, the situation is probably worse than in the United States, as far as I understand. So if we start fracking here, we will see a risk of damaging houses and a lot of really expensive claims. Okay, uh, we're almost at the end of our uh, session and we're gonna have um, uh, closing remarks, brief closing remarks. I'm going to combine a couple questions here. So we're going to have one question here, and another question, question there, here. and one in the back. So please keep them brief, and we'll do our best to answer everything. My name is Catalina Stove. No, uh, uh, so, sorry, sorry, we're here in the front row first, uh, and then we'll come back. So. No long uh, monologues. Uh, being from California, we just think earthquakes make your day a little bit more interesting. Um, <clears throat> But I think what's being lost here is the fact that, unlike all of the other economic bubbles that were discussed, nothing really changed the geopolitical landscape of the world. I mean, the U.S. becoming energy independent for the first time ever is a massive implication. And, and then you look at China, which is just burning up so much coal and having a disastrous effect on the climate. Natural gas would be a far better option, but they don't have the technology. 
So given the fact that the U.S. is now actually moving to become a net exporter of, of gas and oil, hopefully in, in the energy industry's uh, mind, and I'm not part of the energy industry, um, Europe would be a great market. How are you guys going to deal with that from a, po a policy standpoint, essentially shut down the borders and not buy the natural gas? Because if it gets into the air, it has the same disastrous effect on climate anywhere else. And to that effect, why can't Europe actually set a standard for clean production of natural gas to show the U.S., where I come from, you can tell from my accent, how to do it actually clean in the right way? So a two-part question. Okay. One about markets and two about developing a clean fracking standard. Thanks. Uh, in the back, please. Yeah, so I'm, I'm actually European. I live in the U.S. I work at Cornell University. In New York State, fracking uh, is not allowed. High volume fracking is not allowed. Over the border in Pennsylvania, it's, it's, very, like, it's very abundant. Um, New York State is um, investigating the effects. There's a moratorium right now. And I wondered if there are countries in the EU or if the EU is doing that at the moment, if they're investigating fracking and its effects, just like New York State does. And finally, last question. Okay. Uh, are we not somewhat missing the point? I thought the, the issue was here climate change, so limiting carbon emission into the atmosphere. Should we not instead invest in, cl in cleaner nuclear energy, like, for example, using thorium and the thorium cycle as the Indians are developing, instead of wasting time in fracking? That's a fairly neutral point of view, then. <laughs> so, uh, the geopolitics of fracking, uh, I'll combine with uh, regulation to uh, 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 teach the world, robust regulation. Uh, we've heard about concerns uh, in uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, can we, does anybody want to start off tackling the last round of questions, the final round of questions? Maybe the one at the back, the lady at the back. You were talking about New York versus Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I wasn't quite sure what you were referring to. Here in Europe, there's not much happened, really, to, to evaluate. Right, and I guess the, I guess you would pick out Poland as been, been, as one of the countries that's going forward with the shale gas. The UK tentatively going forward too, and so I mean, if you go to Germany, there's much uh, discussion. Um, slowly getting, I think, a bit of progress there. So it's different on uh, depending on which country you go to. Really, maybe at a conference like this, uh, even if the geo community could agree that whether you're for or against shale gas we could at least make contributions towards helping make the decision, do you want shale gas or not? So that means an evaluation of the subsurface from the aquifer point of view or for the deeper subsurface. Repeating the same story. Tom, how about this issue of uh, uh, energy security versus energy independence? Um, hello? Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in terms of markets, I guess I had a few points. One is that you know, actually as a result of the shale gas revolution, so far, the EU is importing huge amounts of coal, um, and that's just a point to note. Um, and in terms of you know, whether or not the EU will import America's shale gas if, if and when it decides to export it, there's the um, cost of transportation, so you know, gasifying, transporting, and um, sorry, liquefaction, transporting across the Atlantic, and then uh, you know, regasifying, and you know, whether or not we do import lots of American gas will depend on the difference in price between the UK, EU and uh, the US and you know as and when uh, environmental regulations in the US start to ratchet up and uh, it does start to export you know, that could raise the price a little bit of the US gas market so I don't necessarily think it's a given that we will start importing huge amounts of um, US shale gas but I certainly take your point that we might. Um, in terms of the fracking standards I can't really answer that question but I would point to what I very briefly mentioned in my talk, which is a different type of standard than emission standard. And that's another way in which you could 
um, control the use of shale gas. So uh, in the UK, we're implementing a, an emissions performance standard, um, which is rated in terms of uh, uh, em emissions per kilowatt hour. And that starts at a certain level, and the expectation is that it will be ratcheted up um, over the years so that uh, increasingly you take different types of generation out of the system. So first of all, coal, and then sort of dirty gas, and, and so on. Um, and finally, I'd probably just make one last point uh, about low carbon. And you know, something we haven't really talked about yet is you know, carbon capture and storage, um, and the implication of that on whether or not we can use shale gas in the medium to long term. Uh, and I think if it is developed successfully, then that could have implications as well. Jörn, did you want to? Um, <coughs> uh, uh, first about nuclear energy. Sorry, I don't think it's, not a, it's a solution. Uh, it's incredibly expensive. There is always a very small risk, but for a very big accident, uh, there's the unsolved problem of what to do with the waste. So, sorry, no. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, the idea of uh, 10 years of no American wars for energy, I think this is a very interesting vision, uh, but I think we are talking about 10 years and not about a century. Uh, what I already said, if you look at how quickly the shale gas production went up, it will just as quickly go down again, and this will be an episode for maybe 10 or 20 years, but not forever. And I think it will be more wise to use this time to become independent from fossil fuels instead of having to start these wars again in 2020. Um, the last question, uh, clean fracking. Uh, Professor Hofstetter, who could not be here because he is ill, so he's an Austrian uh, professor for uh, the extraction of uh, oil and gas. Um, he announced to know how to do fracking in such a way that it is clean so without all these chemicals, uh, well, he announced he knew, and so far he did not deliver, to say it very simply. Uh, it didn't work out so far, and I think many companies tried. Uh, nobody uses all these chemicals for the fun of using chem chemicals. They use chemicals for, because there's no other solution, and I don't see this clean fracking coming. It just didn't work out so far, and I'm very uh, doubtful that it will be possible to do it just with sand and just with water and just with starch. It would be that simple. It would have been done already. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jorn. So we're at the end of our time, but I'm going to give a couple final uh, words. Uh, Brian, you wanted to uh, say something, and then Jesus? Uh, maybe one specific point to the last uh, statements being made here. As far as I know, uh, uh, Quadrille is using that mixture right now in the UK, actually. So I think uh, there are steps in that direction. Let's see how that works out. So I think you're not quite right on that point. Um, I'd be really uh, pleased if, as a result of uh, the discussions today, if the GEO community could at least be active in shale gas exploitation, either speaking out against it based on fact or for it based on fact. I think we have a lot to learn from various uh, experiences in, in Europe. We know that in France, of course, there's a moratorium on shale gas could be due to the environmental concerns, very strong nuclear lobby. One hears of influence of uh, foreign gas companies as well, also playing a role. And so it is, uh, with, with, uh, in the case of Germany, CO2 storage has actually essentially died a death because of public concern over disposing of greenhouse gases in the, in the subsurface. I think we're heading along, not the same lines, hopefully, with shale gas, but alarmism is not the way to go. As I say, if geoscientists can be involved in uh, exploitation, uh, sustainable exploitation, then I think that that will be a benefit uh, down the road for our, yes, children. Yeah, I, I, I will close where, where you started. Eh? I, I think that the CO2 storage has been a, a big loss for climate change, which someone mentioned, and I agree, is the worst problem we have to face now. Nuclear energy was also lost. Huh? So now nuclear energy, we have this far in Spain, with this far from the environment, instead of one kilometer depth, and, um, and we are burning coal and facing our worst problem, which is climate change, much worse. So in that regard, Greenpeace, you, you have not helped us. Huh? We are much worse off because of that. And I fear that with shale gas, it may be the same, 
And, um, and even though I, I claim, and with this I address the Californian, uh, I am a hydrologist. The, the US, and specifically California, st started this integrated water management, which was a great thing. And then Europe came with the uh, Water Framework Directive, which was better. Uh, and it took many of the ideas of the, of the things that were started in California. And some of, them, some of those went back to the US. And so there is this parallel growth. I, I don't like this uh, small nation type of view. When we are talking about energy and we are talking about global uh, climate change, these are global issues. So, yeah, we are... <laughs> so, yeah. I guess many people share this. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, some countries have shared, so no, who cares? I mean, the question is, if we can do things better, we should. My concern, and this is the, uh, and, and with this I respond to the uh, New York versus Pennsylvania thing, my concern is that in Europe we are so afraid of shale gas the, 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 that do not talk to the Commission about shale gas because they say if we open our mouth about shale gas, including anything of that in the framework uh, program or in the uh, horizon 2020, the uh, European Parliament will kill us. So, so the, the message I, I'd like to, to, to convey is that shale gas is there. It is going to be there for a long time. We can extract it. It is Extraction of it is dangerous. It's something which you have to do carefully and you have to do safely. We have to improve upon the way that Americans have done. I'm sure that if we get the shale gas directive or whatever, like with the water, it will improve things and there will be this iteration back and forth. What I don't think we should do is to say no. Playing uh, no to, to fracking. Uh, it would be like shooting ourselves in the, in the foot. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I want to thank the audience for sticking with us. We're on time, and maybe we can have a, hand, um, a round of applause for the panel. <laughs> <laughs>